So this is part two in response to a comment that I got. If you haven't seen part one, please go back and watch part one. Now, before I get into this comment, I want to preface some things here. I want to define some things, okay? So a lot of, a lot of people today, they don't even know what sin is. So in this video, we're going to talk a lot about the law and about sin. In order to understand what sin is, let's look at what the Bible says. Let's look at what it says in Scripture about what sin is. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. In the King James it says, Whosoever commits sin transgresses the law, and sin is the transgression of the law. So first of all, we need to make sure we get it in our minds. Sin equals transgression of the law. In other words, sin equals lawlessness. Now to get a little bit more specific here, the word lawlessness or the phrase transgression of the law is translated from the original Greek anomia, which literally means without law. So sin is being in the state of without the law. Okay, if you don't have the law, if you live without the law, you live in a state of sin. Or to put it very, very simply, if you violate the law, if you disobey the law, you sin. Having said that, let's look at this comment. We dealt with the first few sentences in part one, but this person says here, if you read the simple explanation in Romans chapter seven, it should be clear even to a child. It is summarized in verse six. Number one, the born again believer is delivered from the law. And number two, he is dead to the law. Same in verse four. So here's the thing. Anomians, antinomians, Paulians of today, people who call themselves Christians, but they're against the law of God. If there is such a thing as a Christian who's against the law of God, these people speak like this. They say, oh, we're, we're dead to the law. Christ is the end of the law. And on and on and on it goes. Most of the stuff they quote is from the letters of Paul. That's why I call them Paulians, because they base their entire salvation upon, upon what Paul says, not what Jesus says. And this comment is exhibit A of how people misunderstand Paul, twist the, the letters of Paul, twist the doctrine of Paul to their own destruction. I just did a video called This is a Warning, and it's based upon 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. So I highly recommend you watch that video because this comment is exactly the fulfillment of what I'm talking about in that video. People who misunderstand Paul, take him out of context, twist what he says to justify their lawlessness, their anomianism, okay? Uh, anomians simply means people who live without the law, people who don't have the law of God. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23, you come to me, you profess me as Lord, you have great faith to do great miracles, you cast out demons, you prophesy, you even hear the, the voice of God and you prophesy. Jesus didn't deny all that, but he said, get away from me, depart from me. You who work lawlessness, you anomian, you who live like there is no law. And this person who wrote this comment references Romans chapter 7. It's one of the sinner's favorite chapters. It's one of the favorite chapters to justify sin. And of course, they take it out of context. So in order to put it in context, I'm going to read Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 7, and the first part of Romans chapter 8. And I know you say, oh, that's a lot to read. But listen, it is going to be good. You're going to learn a lot of things. Don't miss it. Hang in there. You need to know what I'm about to say here. This is Romans chapter 6. Paul said, what shall we say then? Okay. Shall we continue in sin? Remember, sin is transgression of the law. Sin is to live without the law. Sin is to violate the law. So in other words, Paul says... Shall we continue to live like there's no law? Shall we continue to disobey God's law? Shall we continue that grace may abound? Paul says, may it never, never be. We who died to sin, how could we live in it any longer? Talk about dead, okay? Paul, first of all, prefaced Romans chapter 7 with being dead to sin. In other words, you do not violate God's law. You do not live without God's law because you have God's law. You're not an anomian. 
Verse 3, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. This is the gospel. We died to sin with Christ on the cross. Remember Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Now, oh, Jesus died for me so that I didn't have to die. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on that cross, but Jesus, God's son, took my... That's not what Paul said. That's not true. That's against the word of God. Jesus didn't die in your place in the sense that you don't have to die on the cross. No, the whole message of the gospel is that you died with him on the cross. I am crucified with Christ. As Paul said here, we were buried, therefore, with him, with him, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. This is being born again. You die to sin. You die to the old life. All has become new. You are a brand new creation in Christ because you rose with him. You are born again with him. When Jesus died on the cross, you died with him. When Jesus rose from the dead, you rose with him in newness of life, therefore born again. Verse 5, for if we have become united with him, again with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be part of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, the lifestyle of living without the law of God, anomianism, done away with, the lifestyle of violating God's law, done away with. Therefore, obviously, logically, if you are not in darkness, you are in light. If you are not without the law, you have the law. If you do not violate the law, you obey the law so that we would no longer be in bondage to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin, freed from lawlessness, freed from violating the law of God, freed from transgressing the law of God. You're no longer bound by the devil to sin. You are free from sin. Therefore, you obey the law of God. Verse 8, but if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, again with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin one time, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Notice Paul is drawing a contrast here between sin and the law of God, between being a slave to sin and being a slave to God, obeying him. Verse 11, thus consider yourselves also to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dead to sin, in other words, you're not violating the law of God anymore. You're obeying the law of God because you are alive to God now. You are obeying him now. Verse 12, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Also, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now Paul goes into talking about the law here. Now, there are a lot of interpretations out there. If you do your studies, you'll understand there are a lot of people that have a lot of different ideas of what Paul means here. The typical run-of-the-mill Christian interpretation is that every time Paul says the law, he's talking about the law as in the law that came through Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. But there are some scholars who believe that Paul is talking about a different law, not the law of God, but the, the law in our own bodies, the law of sin, the law of corruption. Other scholars would tell you that Paul is talking about the halakha, the Jewish law, not God's law, not the law that's specifically written out in the Torah, but the additions to that law that was written by the rabbis, you know, the oral law or the Talmud or the halakha, okay? So we need to understand, just as I said in the video, this is a warning, it is so hard to understand what Paul has to say here because back then, right on the spot, 
in context, in that culture, while Peter, James, John, and Paul were still alive, and everybody that was still alive, and most of them saw Jesus and heard him with their, with their very ears, I mean, people who actually were there. If Paul is so hard to understand that even Peter said he's hard to understand, how much more we, 2,000 years removed from the fact, a lot of the idioms, a lot of the sayings, a lot of the culture has been lost. A lot of it has been changed. Even the language is different, okay? Don't forget, if you were to go back in those days, you would not even be able to understand Paul because he didn't speak English, number one. I mean, let alone to understand the culture and exactly what he was saying. Again, in context, knowing that the apostle Peter himself Someone who actually walked and talked with the Lord, unlike Paul, who didn't walk and talk with the Lord in the flesh. Peter did. He said Paul's hard to understand. So verse 14 again, for sin, don't forget sin here means to be without the law, to violate the law. For sin, for being without the law, will not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Obviously, we have different sayings here that is very confusing. Paul said you don't sin, but he also said you're not under the law. You see, Christians today, what they do is they try to justify their sin by saying we're not under the law. They try to justify their violation of God's law by saying, oh, we're not under the law, or we're dead to the law. And that is totally against the scriptures and totally against the God they claim to serve. Paul makes it very clear here in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin? In other words, shall we violate the law of God? Shall we transgress the law of God? Shall we live like there is no law of God because we're not under the law of God, but under grace? May it never, never, not sometimes, not once in a while. Not, oh, we're all human. We all, we all disobey. We all sin. No, may it never be. As Jesus said, go and sin no more. No more. There's no tolerance at all there. Verse 16, don't you know that when you present yourselves as servants and obey someone, you are the servants of whomever you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. But thanks be to God that whereas you were bond servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were delivered, being made free from sin. You became bond servants of righteousness. So there are only two kinds of people here. Those who are slaves to sin and those who are slaves to God. Slaves to righteousness. You either obey the law of sin or you obey the law of righteousness, the law of God. Because if you do not obey the law of God, then you sin. Because sin is the transgression of the law. Verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For as you presented your members as servants to uncleanness and to wickedness upon wickedness, even so now present your members as servants to righteousness for sanctification. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit then did you have at that time in the things of which you now are ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and having become servants of God, you have your fruit of sanctification and the result of eternal life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here we go with Romans chapter 7. Or don't you know, brothers, for I speak to men who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman that has a husband is bound by law to the husband while he lives. But if the husband dies, she is discharged from the law of the husband. So then, while the husband lives, she is joined to another man, she would be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brothers, you also were made dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you would be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might produce fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were through the law worked in our members to bring out fruit to death. But now we have been discharged from the law, having died to that in which we were held, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. 
Here Paul is drawing a distinction between the spirit and the letter. Now talking about the letter in and of itself. I mean just words on a paper. Compared to the spirit, okay? Both of which say the same thing because it's by the spirit the law came obviously. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never, here we go again, never be. Some Christians believe that the law of God is the law of sin. May it never be, Paul says. He goes on to say, however, I wouldn't have known sin except through the law. For I wouldn't have known coveting unless the law had said, you shall not covet. And that is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21. Verse 8, but sin, finding occasion through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of coveting. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Again, Paul makes a distinction. It's either sin is alive in your life or the law is alive in your life. Verse 10, the commandment which was for life, this I found to be for death. For sin, finding occasion through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Now, if you were to just stop there, you would think that Paul would go on to say, oh yeah, the law is not very good, the law is not very holy, the law is not very righteous, it's not very just. I mean, look what it does to me, look what it does. But no, he says the opposite. So don't misunderstand Paul. Verse 12, he goes on to say the opposite of what everybody else would think, he would say. He says, therefore, therefore, the law indeed is holy. Not sinful, holy. And the commandments, holy, righteous. That word righteous in a lot of other translations is just. The law is not unjust to demand things that you can't do. Anybody that would give you a law that you cannot obey, that's unjust. You, you have to have a law that you can obey in order for it to be just. If the law that's delivered to you is a law that you cannot do and you're expected to do it, that's not just, that's unjust. Remember Deuteronomy chapter 30 makes it very clear. After the law was given, God said, this is not too hard for you. Remember, God is not a tyrant. Remember, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's parents, before Jesus came, before the cross, before the resurrection, both of them walked in all, A-L-L, all the commandments of the Lord blamelessly. If they can do it without Jesus, how much more can we do it with Jesus? Therefore, the law indeed is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 13, he goes on to say, Did then that which is good become death to me? May it never be. Now, a lot of people would say, isn't that what Paul just said, that the, that the law became death to him? But Paul cleared that up and said, that's not what I mean. Bible publishers should have put the letters of Paul in the Apocrypha, because you see, the letters of Paul are, are very hard to understand. The apostle Peter was right. Some of the things that Paul says is very hard to understand. And the letters of Paul should not be available to simple people who misunderstand, misinterpret, twist his letters to justify their lawlessness, to justify their violation of the law, because that leads to their destruction, as Peter warned of in 2 Peter chapter 3. Continuing with verse 13, Paul said, But sin that it might be shown to be sin, was producing death in me through that which is good. So it wasn't the law, but it was sin that was producing death in him. That through the commandment, sin might become exceedingly sinful. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. Oh boy, oh boy, lots of Christians get it wrong. They think the law is fleshly. Oh, the works of the law. That's just, that's just doing it out of the flesh instead of out of faith. It's not, it's not, really, part, it's not really doing it by the spirit. It's, it's doing it by the flesh when you obey God. That's not what Paul said here. He said the law is spiritual. And then he goes on to say, but I am fleshly, sold under sin. Verse 15, for I don't understand what I'm doing. I, for I don't practice what I desire to do, but what I hate that I do. But if what I don't desire that I do, I consent to the law that it is good. So now it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For desire is present with me, but I don't find it doing that which is good. For the good which I desire, I don't do. 
But the evil which I don't desire, that I practice. But if what I don't desire, that I do, it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. Don't forget Paul's writing style. He likes to role play. And here he's role playing that the role of a sinner. The role of someone who is without God, who is going by the flesh and not by the spirit. Remember in another part of his writings, he said, I speak as a fool. Is Paul a fool? I wouldn't say so, but he role plays as a fool. He spoke as a fool. He even said, I speak as a fool. Here he's speaking as a sinner. Does that mean that he's bound to sin? I wouldn't say so. Verse 21, I find then the law that while I desire to do good, evil is present. For I delight in God's law after the inward person. Do you delight in God's law in the inward person? Do you really delight in it? Read Psalm 119 about how much the law of God is, 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 is sweeter than honey and more precious than gold. And, and it's the law of liberty. Verse 22 again. For I delight in God's law after the inward person. But I see a different law in my members. Here we go. Paul is talking about different laws here. Again, don't confuse this. He's talking about one law, and then he talks about a different law. But I see a different law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. What's the law of my mind? Of course, the law of God is the law of his mind. He just defined that in verse 22. And bringing me into captivity under the law of sin, which is in my members. So here he distinctively makes a difference between the law of sin and the law of God. Don't forget the law of God is not the law of sin because the law of God is holy, holy, just, and good. So he wraps up his role playing as a sinner in verse 24 as he says, What a wretched man I am! Who will deliver me out of the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve, serve God's law. Can you say that? Can you say that with your mind, with your spirit, that you serve God's law? But with the flesh, sin's law. Just going to read a few more verses in chapter 8. Paul goes on to say, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Most people, even most people who go to church, are not even in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ Jesus, well, that's another whole topic. It's a lot more than just believing. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus? It's God's law, obviously. Because God's law is holy, just, and good. Because Moses got God's law through the Spirit. He didn't get it from Joe Blow walking by. He didn't get it from some nomad gypsy walking through the desert. He got it from the Spirit of God. And don't forget, Jesus is the Word in the flesh. He is the personification of the Word of God. And what is the law of God? It's the Word. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search those scriptures because you think that in them, in and of themselves, you, you find life. You search those scriptures including the Torah, obviously, because you think that in them and them alone, you get life in and of itself, but you don't realize that all of that is me. All of that speaks of me. When Moses wrote down the law, he was writing down my attributes, my personality, my laws, because I am the law, the word in the flesh. Verse 3, for what the law couldn't do, that is the law obviously in and of itself, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us. That word fulfilled is the word plerao, which means according to Thayer's Greek lexicon, definition number 2, C3, it means to cause God's will as made known in the law, to be obeyed as it should be. So let me say this again, verse 3. For what the law couldn't do, obviously that's talking about the law in and of itself, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. So what couldn't the law do? Well, the law in and of itself couldn't make people obey it. It couldn't bring about sinlessness. But God did. 
as Paul said here, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled, in other words, obeyed in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus is for to get what the law could not do in and of itself, which means obedience. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind of the flesh is hostile toward God, for it is not subject to God's law. Notice here, Paul is also drawing another distinction between you're either hostile toward God or you're subject to God's law. Do you want to be hostile to God? or subject to his law. So the mind of the flesh is hostile toward God, for it is not subject to God's law, neither indeed can be. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. In other words, if you are not subject to God's law, you cannot please God, obviously. Back to this comment, okay? Let's read this again. If you read the simple explanation in Romans chapter 7, it should be clear even to a child. It is summarized in verse 6. Number one, the born-again believer is delivered from the law. Paul made it very clear. If you are not obeying God's law, you are obeying the law of sin. And if you are obeying the law of sin, there is no salvation for you because it brings spiritual death. Number two, he is dead to the law. But you don't understand what that means. You conveniently did not mention the enormous amount of times that Paul said in that context, in that same context, in the chapter before and that very chapter, Paul talks about being dead to sin. You conveniently didn't mention being dead to sin. Then you said, if it is dead to you, it is dead, finished, kaput, etc., etc. No matter how much you dress up the dead, it stays dead. Yes, dead to sin. You are dead to being an anomian. You are dead to being without the law. Therefore, you are obeying the law. Point number three here, this person said, serve in newness of the spirit, i.e. the new covenant born again life. Well, yeah, obviously. The legalists don't like that concept. You are very legalistic about your law, about how to get saved, about your law, about how the New Testament works. Oldness of the letter, the law, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7, calls it the letter kills, <laughs> the, letter, the letter kills, namely the ministry of death written and engraved in stone. Clearly the Ten Commandments. What is unclear about it? You need a good Pharisee to confuse it. <laughs> okay, Paul is talking about the dead letter. The dead letters, of course, the letters on paper, the letters that are engraved in stone are not alive in and of themselves. And this person says, you need a good Pharisee to confuse it. My friends, don't allow the Pharisees draw, draw, draw you into the slavery of the law again. Very clear. It's either you're enslaved to the law of God or you're enslaved to the law of Satan. You're enslaved to the law of God or you're enslaved to the law of sin. And it sounds like, it seems to me, this poor person is very much enslaved to the law of sin because they speak against the law of God. The very law that comes from the very God they claim to believe in and they claim to love. Then they go to say, you need a good Pharisee to confuse it. Don't allow the Pharisees drag you into the slavery of the law again. Well, you better not read the letters of Paul anymore. You better rip those out of your Bible. Because Paul said, not once, but twice, that he is a Pharisee. You are knocking down Pharisees, yet you quote a Pharisee in all points. I don't see you quoting Jesus. I don't see you quoting James. I don't see you quoting John here. You quote a Pharisee. If there's anybody in the scriptures that clearly identifies as a Pharisee, it's Paul. He didn't say, I was a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee. There you have it. If you found any value in this video, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you're subscribed. And by all means, seek God with all your heart. And if you do, you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.